Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming together to immerse ourselves in this rich uh, body of wisdom that lies in pages before us and also in faces before us. We are in a double portion, uh, that of Acharemot Kiddushim, just found in the book of Leviticus, beginning with chapter 16. We'll read through the English translation of our portion. I'll share with you a focused study about it, and then we'll open it up for our collaborative conversation about it. If you'd like to go ahead and unmute together at this time, we can recite our blessing and giving thanks for this moment. Baruch Thank you, God, for the opportunity to immerse ourselves in words, deeds, and relationships of Torah. Book of Leviticus, chapter 16, verse 1. I'll share with you the opening verses and then invite others to have an opportunity to read as well. Adonai spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, who died when they drew too close to the presence of God. Adonai said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come at will into the shrine behind the curtain in front of the cover that is upon the ark, lest he die. For I appear in the cloud over the cover. Thus only shall Aaron enter the shrine with a bull of the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall be dressed in a sacral linen tunic with linen breeches next to his flesh and be girt with a linen sash, and he shall wear a linen turban. He has sacral vestments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And from the Israelite community, he shall take two he goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Sherry, would you like to read a little bit, starting at verse 6? Thank you. Aaron is to offer his own bull a sin offering to make expiation for himself and for his household. Aaron shall take the two he goats and let them stand before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting, meeting, and he shall place lots upon the two goats, one marked for the Lord and the other marked for Az Azazel. Um, Aaron shall, shall bring forward the goat de uh, de uh, designated by lot, by lot for the Lord, which he is to offer as a sin offering, while the goat de designated by lot for Azazel shall be left for, for standing alive before the Lord to make expiation with it and to send it off to the wilderness for Az Azazel. Steve, would you like to continue at verse 11? Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Aaron shall then offer his bull of sin offering to make expiation for himself and his household. He shall slaughter his bull of sin offering, and he shall take a panful of glowing coal scooped from the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of finely ground aromatic incense, and bring this behind the curtain. He shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, so the cloud from the incense screens the cover that is over the ark of the pack, lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger over the cover on the east side. And in front of the cover, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. He shall then slaughter the people's goat, a sin offering, bring its blood behind the curtain and do this with its blood as he had done with the blood of the bull. He shall sprinkle it over the cover and in front of the cover. Thank you. Richard, you want to read a little bit there at verse 16? You bet. Thank you, Mary. Thus he shall purge the shrine of the uncleanness and transgressions of the Israelites, whatever their sins, and shall do the same for the tent of meeting, which abides with them in the midst of the uncleanliness. When he goes in to make expiation in the shrine, nobody else shall be in the tent of meeting 
until he comes out. And he has made expiation for himself and his household and for the whole congregation of Israel. He shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and purge it. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and of the goat and apply it to each of the horns of the altar. And the rest of the blood he shall sprinkle on it with his finger seven times. Thus he shall cleanse it and of the cleanse it of the uncleanliness of the Israelites and, and consecrate and consecrate it. When he has finished purging the shrine, the tent of meeting, and the altar, the live goat shall be brought forward. Aaron shall lay both hands, both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities and transgressions of the Israelites, whatever their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and it shall be sent off to the wilderness through a designated man. Thus the goat shall carry on it all the iniquities to an accessible region, inaccessible region, and the goat shall be set free in the wilderness. Thank you. Hannah, do you want to read a little bit? Verse 23. And Aaron shall go into the tent of meeting, take off the linen vestments that he put on when he entered the shrine, and leave them there. He shall bathe his body in water in the holy precinct and put on his vestments. Then he shall come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people, making expiation for himself and for the people. The fat of the purgation offering he shall turn into smoke on the altar. The one who set the Azazel goat free shall wash those clothes and bathe the body in water, and after that may re-enter the camp. One. Sure. The bull of purgation offering and the goat of purgation offering, whose blood was brought into the purge the shrine, shall be taken outside the camp, and their hides, flesh, and dung shall be consumed in fire. The one who burned them shall wash those clothes and bathe bo the body in water, and after that may re enter camp. Thank you so much. Uh, Margot, do you want to read there? Verse 29. And this shall be to you a law for all time. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall practice self-denial, and you shall do no manner of work, neither the citizen nor the alien who ride, uh, resides among you. For on this day of atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you of all your sins. You shall be clean before before the Lord. It shall be Sabbath of complete rest for you. You shall practice self-denial. It is the law of all times. The priest who has been anointed and ordained to, to, excuse me, to serve as, as priest um, in, in place of his father shall make expiation. He shall put on linen vestments, the sacred uh, vestments, he, he shall purge the innermost shrine. He shall purge the tent of meeting and the altar. He shall make expiation for the priests and for all, for all the people of the congregation. This shall be to you a law for all time to make atonement for the Israelites for all their sins once a year. And Moses did as the Lord had commanded him. Thank you, Margo. Steve, would you like to read at the beginning of chapter 17? Oh, okay. oh, oh Steve, another Steve. Another Steve. Oh, yeah. And you have to, there Very, you go. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. The Eternal One spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the Israelite people and say to them, this is what the Eternal has commanded. If any one of the house of Israel slaughters an ox or sheep or goat in the camp or does so outside the camp and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to present it as an offering to the eternal before the eternal's tabernacle, blood guilt shall be imputed to that person. Having shed blood, that person shall be cut off from among this people. This is an order that the Israelites may bring the sacrifices which they have been making in the open, that they may bring them before the eternal. 
to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting and offer them as sacrifices of well-being to the eternal, that the priest may dash the blood against the altar of the eternal at the entrance of the tent of meeting and turn the fat into smoke as a pleasing odor to the eternal and that they may offer their sacrifices no more to the goat demons after whom they stray. This shall be to them a law for all time throughout all the ages. Thank you, Steve. Martine, would you like to continue at verse eight? Thank you. Oops. Say to them further, if any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who reside among them offers a burnt offering or a sacrifice and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting, to offer it to Adonai, that person shall be cut off from his people. And if any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who reside among them partakes of any blood, I will set my face against the person who partakes of the blood. I will cut that person off from among kin. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have assigned it to you for making expiation for your lives upon the altar. It is the blood as life that affects expiation. Therefore, I say to the Israelite people, no person among you shall partake of blood, nor shall the stranger who resides among you partake of blood. Thank you, Martine. Let me invite Susan and David, if you would continue with verse 13. Go. And any man from the children of Israel and from the aliens who reside among them who will hunt game, animal or bird, that may be eaten, he shall spill out its blood and cover it with dust. Because all well, I'm sorry. Because all flesh is life. It is it is his its blood. Every one of those who eat it will be cut off. And if he will not wash them and will not wash his flesh, then he shall bear his crime. And yod heh vav -He spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them, I am yod heh vav -He, your God. You shall not do like what is done in the land of Egypt in which you lived, and you shall not do like what is done in the land of Canaan, to which I'm bringing you, and you shall not go by their laws. You shall do my judgments, and you shall observe my laws to go by them. I am yod heh vav -He, your God. And you shall observe my laws and my judgments, which when a human being will do them, he will live through them. I am yod heh vav -He. Thank you so much. Let me invite Justin, if you'd like to continue there, verse six. Thank you, Rabbi. No man shall come near to any of his close relatives to uncover their nakedness. I am Hashem. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. The nakedness of your sister whether your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether born to one who may remain in the home or born to one who must be sent outside, you shall not uncover their nakedness. The nakedness of your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, you shall not uncover their nakedness for they are your own nakedness. The nakedness of the daughter of your father's wife Born to your father, she is your sister. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister. She is the close relative of your father. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, for she is the close relative of your mother. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. You shall not come near his wife. She is your aunt. 
You shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter. You shall not take in marriage her da son's daughter or her daughter's daughter. To uncover her nakedness, they are close relatives. It is evil counsel. Thank you so much, Justin. Mark Thompson, would you like to continue there at verse 18? Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Rabbi. Do not marry a woman as a rival to her sister and uncover her nakedness in the other's lifetime. Do not come near a woman during her period of uncleanness to uncover her nakedness. Do not have carnal relations with your neighbor's wife and defile yourself with her. Do not allow any of your offspring to be offered up to Molech, and do not profane the name of your God, I am Adonai. Do not lie with a male as one lies with a woman, it is an abhorrence. Do not have carnal relations with any beast and defy, defile yourself thereby, and let no woman lend herself to a beast to mate with, it is perversion. Do not defile yourselves in any of those ways, for it is by such that the nations that I am casting out before you defiled themselves. Thus the land became defiled, and I called it to account for its iniquity, and the land spewed out its inhabitants. But you must keep my laws and my rules, and you must not do any of these abhorrent things. Neither the citizens nor the stranger who resides among you. For all those abhorrent things were done by the people who were in the land before you. And that land became defiled. So let not the land spew you out for defiling it as it spewed out the nation that came before you all who do any of these abhorrent things each or such persons shall be cut off from their people you shall keep my charge not to engage in any of the abhorrent practices that were carried on before you, and you shall not defile yourselves through them. I am Adonai, your God. Thank you, Mark. And Robin, you. would you like to continue at the very start of chapter 19? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. Adonai spoke to Moses saying, speak to the whole Israelite community and say to them, you shall be holy for I, your God Adonai, am holy. You shall each revere your mother and your father and keep my Sabbaths. I, Adonai, am your God. Do not turn to idols to make molten gods for yourselves. I am Adonai, your God. When you sacrifice an offering of well-being to Adonai, sacrifice it so that it may be accepted on your behalf. It shall be eaten on the day you sacrifice it or on the day following but what is left by the third day must be consumed in fire. If it should be eaten on the third day, it is an offensive thing. It will not be acceptable. And one who eats of it shall bear the guilt for having profaned what is sacred to Adonai. That person shall be cut off from kin. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap all the way to the edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not pick your vineyard bare or gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You, sh you shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am Adonai, your God. Thank you so much, Robin. 
Marty, would you like to continue there at verse 11? Uh, thank you, Rabbi. Um, you shall not steal. You shall not deal deceitfully or falsely with one another. You shall not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not defraud your fellow. You shall not commit robbery. The wages of a laborer shall not remain with you until morning. You shall not insult the deaf or place a stumbling block before the blind. You shall, you shall fear your God, I am the Lord. You shall not render an unfair, just unfair decision. Do not favor the poor or show deference to the rich. Tr judge your kinsmen fairly. Do not deal basely with your countrymen. Do not profit by the blood of your fellow. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your kinsfolk in your heart. Reprove your kinsmen, but incur no guilt because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your countrymen. Love your fellow as yourself. I am the Lord. You shall observe my rules. Shall not let your cattle mate with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed. You shall not put on cloth from a mixture of two kinds of material. Thank you, Marty. And Robert, would you like to continue there at verse 20? Yes, thank you. And whosoever lieth carnally with a woman that is a bondmaid, betrothed to an husband, and not at all redeemed, nor freedom given her, shall she be scourged. They shall not be put to death because she was not free. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, even a ram for a trespass offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering before the Lord for his sin, which he hath done. And the sin which he hath done shall be forgiven him. And when ye shall come into the land, and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, then ye shall count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised. Three years shall ye be, three years shall it be as uncircumcised unto you. It shall not be eaten up. But in the fourth year, all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise the Lord withal. And in the fifth year shall ye eat of the fruit thereof that it may yield unto you the increase thereof. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall ye use enchantment nor observe times. Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Thank you so much, Robert. Catherine, would you like to continue at verse 31? Okay, yes. Thank you, Rabbi. Do not turn to ghosts and do not inquire of familiar spirits to be defiled by them, I am Adonai your God. You shall rise before the aged and show deference to the old. You shall fear your God, I am Adonai. When a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not wrong him. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as one of your citizens. You shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am Lord, I am the Lord, I am your God. You shall not falsify measures of length, weight, or capacity. You shall have an honest balance, honest weights, an honest ifa, and an honest in. In, I am Adonai, your, I am your God, who freed you from the land of Egypt. You shall faithfully observe all my laws and all my rules. I am Adonai. Thank you, Catherine. And Rose, would you like to read at the very start of chapter 20?
Okay. And Hashem spoke to Moses, say further to the Israelite people, anyone among the Israelites or among the strangers residing in Israel who gives any offspring to Moloch shall be put to death. The people of the land shall pelt the person with stones. And I will set my face against that party whom I will cut off from among the people for having given offspring to Moloch and so defiled my sanctuary and profaned my holy name. And if the people of the land shall shut their eyes to that party's giving offspring to Moloch and should not put the person to death, I myself will set my face against that party's kin as well. I will cut off from among their people both that person and all who follow and going astray uh, to Moloch. And if any person turns to ghosts and familiar spirits and goes astray after them, I will set my face against that person whom I will cut off from among the people. You shall sanctify yourselves and be holy, for I am Hashem and your God. You shall faithfully observe my laws. I, Hashem, make you holy. If anyone insults either father or mother, that person shall be put to death. That person has insulted father and mother and retains the blood guilt. Thank you so much, Rob. Paul, would you like to continue at verse 10? Uh, thank you, Rabbi. A man who will commit adultery with a man's wife will commit adul uh, adultery with his fellow's wife. The adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. A man who shall lie with his father's wife will have uncovered his father's shame. The two of them shall be put to death. Their blood is upon themselves. A man who shall lie with his daughter-in-law, the two of them shall be put to death. They have committed a perversion. Their blood is upon themselves. A man who lies, lies with a man as one lies with a woman, they have both done an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon themselves. A man who shall take a woman and her mother, it is a depraved plot. They shall burn him and them in fire, and there shall not be depravity among you. A man who shall lie with an animal shall be put to death, and you shall kill the animal. And, and a woman who approaches any animal for it to mate with her, you shall kill the woman and the animal. Shall, they shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. A man who shall take his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother, and he shall see her nakedness, and, and, she'll, and shall see his nakedness, is a disgrace. And they shall be cut off in the sight of the members of the people. He shall be, he will have uncovered the nakedness of his sister, and he shall bear his iniquity. A man who will lie with a woman in her affliction and has uncovered her nakedness, he will have bared her source, and she has bared the source of her blood. The two of them will be cut off from the midst of their people. The nakedness of your mother's sister or your father's sister's shall you not uncover for that is bearing one's that is bearing one's own flesh they shall bear their iniquity and the man who shall lie with his aunt will have uncovered the nakedness of his aunt they shall bear their sin they shall die childless a man who shall take his brother's wife it is loathsome he will have uncovered his brother's shame they shall be childless. Thank you, Paul. You shall faithfully observe all my laws and all my regulations, lest the land to which I bring you to settle and spew you out. You shall not follow the practices of the nation that I am driving out before you, for it is because they did all these things that I abhorred them and said to you, you shall possess their land, for I will give it to you to possess, a land flowing with milk and honey. I, Adonai, am your God, who has set you apart from other peoples. So you shall set apart the clean beast from the unclean, the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not draw abomination upon yourselves through beast or bird or anything with which the ground is alive, which I have set apart for you to treat as unclean. 
You shall be holy to me, for I, Adonai, am holy. And I have set you apart from other peoples to be mine. A man or a woman who has a ghost or a familiar spirit shall be put to death. They shall be pelted with stones. Their blood guilt shall be upon them. That's our portion for the week. If you have a copy of this study sheet, I invite you to uh, take it out at, at this point. And uh, I'd like to focus uh, this week's study by placing it in context of what we have experienced and observed over the last eight days in terms of the Jewish calendar. And that is a period that began with the observance of Yom HaShoah, that uh, uh, recognition and uh, of, the, uh, of the Holocaust, uh, which was followed by Yom HaZikaron, which is the Israeli uh, Memorial Day, honoring those who have fallen in defense of the state of Israel. And then it concludes uh, as it did uh, last night, today, with Yom HaAtzma'ut, which is celebrates the uh, establishment of the state of Israel in 1948. So I, I'd just like to have us keep in mind that flow of events over a course of eight days, which began with the recognition that uh, a third of the Jewish worldwide population was annihilated uh, as a result of the Shoah. Uh, bringing the Jewish people almost to the verge uh, of total extinction. It is then followed by a day honoring those who died in defense of reestablishing and defending the sovereignty for the Jewish people, and then concludes with a celebration of the establishment of that sovereignty in the form of the creation of the state of Israel. This notion of almost obliteration to a sense of revival. And as I acknowledged in this week's email, Israelis consider this, these eight days to constitute days of awe, which is what sometimes we, especially in the diaspora, consider uh, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur to be the days of awe. Here, this restoration of, of Jewish sovereignty is what Israelis consider to be days of awe. So with that as way of background, I'd actually like to delve into our Torah portion by looking at a couple of poems and then a painting, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, the first is a, is a poem uh, by a, uh, a German uh, poet and writer, Ingeborg Bachmann. And actually the three artists that we're gonna be looking at, these two poets and then a painter, are all creating within the framework of German culture. Uh, Ingeborg, Bachmann was uh, born in, in Germany and her father was, was actually a member of the Nazi party. And she emerges uh, trying to understand this death culture that her father was an intimate part of. She herself meets in 1948 Paul Ceylon, who is uh, a Jewish refugee from Romania. Uh, he's a poet. <clears throat> excuse me, and she meets him in Vienna. They fall in love and they have a, this very intense relationship for, for a good 10 years. Uh, and she is, she like Paul saint -Lan, is trying to make sense of this German culture that produced this hara known as the Shoah. And they're doing it from within the culture. Paul saint -Lan is is trying to, work through the German language to see if there's some way to, re, to reclaim, if you will, to redeem uh, the language itself from the horrors to, to which it, it gave voice and, and instrumentality. And certainly Ingeborg Bachmann from her own personal family situation is trying to uh, find some degree of redemption. And she wrote a number of poems and then she wrote some extraordinary uh, philosophical writings and, and novels. And uh, I'd like to share with you excerpts from a poem she wrote called Bohemia Lies by the Sea. If Bohemia still lies by the sea, I'll believe in the sea again. And believing in the sea, thus I can hope for land. I still border on a word and on another land. I border like little else on everything and more. 
a bohemian, a wandering minstrel who has nothing, who is held by nothing, gifted only at seeing by a doubtful sea, the land of my choice. And Bohemia is in uh, Central Eastern Europe and it is landlocked. There is no sea that borders uh, Bohemia. So there's something quite extraordinary about the way she's using this bit of poetic language to imagine the possibility of uh, Bohemia actually being by the sea. Her use of, uh, the re of language here is, is her way of seeing language and its possibility uh, to regenerate new life and new hope. And for her, she lived in a culture that used language uh, to destroy, that used language to create binary choices, that used language to crush other people, to dehumanize other people. And so she turns to the language of literature and the language of poetry to see uh, its possibility for restoring life, for restoring hope. And she finds in literature, its power is in its lack of closure, that it is, uh, literature is open-ended in creating provocations, in creating narrative and stories, and in its refusal to uh, conclude in any kind of final judgments, if you will. And so here we are in this, this poem, which ultimately is, in a sense, defying what seems to be reality, which is that Bohemia is landlocked, it's not by the sea. And, and she uses this bit of poetry to express a sense of utopia, that if, if one were to keep believing, to keep hoping, and perhaps to keep writing, that one can achieve and move forward out of the, the constraints of what seems to be real to move towards what one aspires to, what one longs to achieve, to be by the sea. The sense of longing is something that we're going to see replicated uh, in, in the next poem quite explicitly. And uh, this is a poem by Nellie Sachs. Nellie Sachs was born in Germany, Jewish, and she had, and her family had to escape. They were on the, the last plane uh, to leave Berlin uh, for Sweden. Uh, when she was in Sweden, uh, she tried to make sense of what was happening to the rest of her family, what was happening uh, to Jewish society in general in, in Germany. Uh, she goes into some personal depression and she becomes a, a very profound writer of poetry eventually winning the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1966. And so she's looking back upon what's happened in the Shoah, trying to make sense of all those who are, who are lost and what does it mean to have experienced this kind of loss. So this is her poem, Perhaps God Needs the Longing. But perhaps God needs the longing wherever else should it dwell, which with kisses and tears and sighs fills mysterious spaces of air, and perhaps is invisible soil from which roots of stars grow and swell, and the radiant voice across fields of parting which calls to reunion there. Oh, my beloved, perhaps in the sky of longing, worlds have been born of our love, just as our breathing in and out builds a cradle for life and death. We are grains of sand, dark with farewells, lost in birth's secret treasure trove. Around us already, perhaps future moons, suns, and stars blaze in a fiery wreath. Here, here Nellie Sachs is, is looking at longing, uh, not so much as desiring to have something that one doesn't have, but rather uh, to see longing uh, as a movement away from loss to a to procreation uh, of new life. So for her, she sees, ah, this longing is actually what gives the possibility of birth, the desire to have intimacy, desire to have connection, 
and thus uh, to create new worlds, future moons, suns, and stars blaze in a fiery wreath. So I'd like to just pursue these notions that we're experiencing here about, uh, about movement, about moving towards uh, something, about uh, being having a sense of longing. And I was looking at the word underway, to be underway. And uh, in the Oxford English Dictionary, it defines underway as a ship moving freely through the water as opposed to being anchored, moored, or aground. And the Oxford English Dictionary notes that the word underway we notice in literature first probably in about the 17th century in the Netherlands, where it's used as a, as a nautical term. And so the notion about being underway as being uh, free from being anchored, uh, free from being moored or aground. And just to follow this uh, notion a little bit further, there's a beautiful article that was written by Johannes Anderegg about Nellie Sachs called The Poem and the Transformation in which Johannes Anderegg describes longing as an expression of being underway. That notion that longing is this desire for movement, uh, not for possession, but for movement uh, and for connection with another. So now I'd like to take a look at the painting, uh, which is by, by Ansem Kiefer, which is on the front of the study sheet. And this is Ansel, uh, Anselm Kiefer. I was born in, in Germany. Uh, and he is also trying to make sense of how could the history of his country produce uh, the murderous uh, res result that it did. And he paints this painting, which is actually uh, more of a construct than a painting because it's done on a burlap, not canvas. Uh, it is a very thick painting. It has uh, lots of emulsion. It has lots of resin that's dripped on it. And he has called this painting Bohemia Lies by the Sea, which is the name of the poem by Ingeborg Bachmann. And if one were to take a magnifying glass to it, you'd see that inscribed actually at the, at the very top of the painting is the title of Ingeborg Bachmann's poem. And so here he has taken this notion of Ingeborg Bachmann's uh, poetry of moving towards some place that seems impossible to get to, and yet one moves towards it anyway with a sense of hope, uh, a sense of desire for some kind of utopian encounter. And the picture here is that of a field with poppies on it. And poppies often are associated with a sense of uh, almost a comatose uh, existence of falling asleep, Sometimes it's also associated with an honoring of those who have fallen, of veterans who have fallen. And although you may not be able to tell quite in the reproduction uh, here, uh, the poppies are, most of them are painted in red, indicating some, some uh, evocative of blood. And um, so what Ansel, uh, Anselm Kiefer has done here, I think, is to give us this slim horizon, and yet the, the painting itself is kind of upward in its trajectory, moving towards that slim horizon. And uh, Kiefer himself seems to be acknowledging this desire to move uh, through these difficult fields uh, and to, to uh, avoid the, uh, the comatose possibilities that exist in these fields of loss and then move towards uh, what seems to be impossible, that is water uh, of the sea by uh, the shores of, uh, by the borders of Bohemia. And here is what uh, our artist Ansem Kiefer has said about longing, which is the theme that we're following here. He wrote, art is longing. You never arrive, but you keep going in the hope that you will. So I just want to put now in conclusion, the structure of our Torah portion, because the Torah portion that we've just read begins in death. It begins with God spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, who drew too close to God and they died. 
And so it begins in death and then immediately moves into a description of the ritual known, which we know as the ritual of Yom Kippur, as it was practiced during the days of the temple, and which the rabbis evolved into the, uh, the holy day that we now know it to be. And Yom Kippur is a, if you will, a death and rebirth ritual. It's designed to, to uh, dramatize and ritualize the death of the old self and then the birth of a new self. And that is in part why we go through this process of wearing white, we, we fast for a day, we are shedding the old skin of the old self in order to enter the new year with uh, new purpose and new self. And we have um, uh, this, this notion that uh, I'll just end with, with uh, Midrash, number eight from Midrash Mechilta, uh, which Rabbi Yeshua says, the Holy Blessed One said to Moses, all that Israel has to do is to go forward. These are words that are spoken at the, the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea. And the, the, the notion there is, it's not complicated. All you need to do to, is to keep moving forward, to not get stuck, not to, not to retreat, uh, not to fall and collapse in despair at the border of some a difficult obstacle that lies before you, just keep moving forward. And so uh, I think that is part of what is being portrayed here, at least as I read it, that the capacity to keep moving through these difficult moments, including moments of loss and moments of death, if we keep moving forward, there's a holiness about being underway. So with that, I'd love to encounter and experience and hear uh, what you felt, what you saw, and during our reading and our study of our portion. If you'd raise your hand, I'd love to call upon you. Richard. Yes, um, thank you, Rabbi. Um, I've got a lot of notes, but I'm just going to boil it down to what I think is important. Uh, this business of self-denial and afflicting the self, and how do we do that? We do it by fasting, and I thought, well, we fast, because we're not feeding any of our desires. We're being desireless. We're abandoning what we call the self to allow the duration of our relationship with God. That there's no feeding desires. There's no responding to hunger. And my last line is, only the longing remains. Oh. Only the longing remains. Oh. Thank you. Okay, uh, Steve, and then I'll call on Rose. Yeah. Oh, uh, it bothers me about Germany because it's really a federated uh, republic and you're really talking about Prussia. And that's where uh, Deutschland über alles came to Prussia would become all of Germany. Mm -hmm. And if you read Einstein's book, he said in Bavaria where he lived, it was very, uh, very liberal. And it's only when the Prussians came down. And when I was in Soviet Union, they say, oh, this goes all the way back to the 11th century mm -hmm. with the Teutonic Knights. And they cited it always this movie by Sergei Einstein, Eisenstein, uh, Alexander Nevsky and the Teutonic Knights. And they said, that's why they have this antipathy toward Germany. It hasn't changed at all since the 11th century. So how are you going to overcome all of this? Money? Thank you, Steve. Thank you. And, and let me call upon uh, Rose and, and then Paul. Yeah, Rose. Now let me make sure I'm not muted. Um, yeah, and I guess what you talked about at the beginning, um, that this these Parshot play uh, reflect what we're going through with um, um, Yom HaTzmaut and Yom, you know, the memorials and, uh, you know, uh, what happened in the Shoah with those words, Achorei Mot, after all the death and dying that happened. 
what you're saying is you you have to go forth. You can't you can't look back. You have to move ahead. And the first example of that is Lot's wife in Genesis. You know, mm. you gotta you can't look back, you gotta keep going. And you know, and then this is also reflected in what happened with the Exodus when and the Flesha, there are all sorts of kind of nodes in the Torah where you know it's like Yogi Berra said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. It's the same thing, you know. Sometimes you get to a point where you can't look back on what has happened before. You have to move on, or you will turn to stone like Lot's wife. Hmm. You, I, I thank you for bringing up about Lot and Lot's wife and kind of re emphasizing this notion about uh, moving forward. And uh, as you're speaking, uh, it, it occurred to me once again that the whole Jewish Bible is a, a story about a people who are constantly underway. I mean, because the Jewish Bible ends not with a sense of final resolution to this story of exile and so forth, but it ends with a ends with the uh, Israelites in exile once again being asked by the Emperor of Persia says, "Well, if you want to go." back to the land of Israel and rebuild the temple, go ahead and do it. And, and it doesn't end with the people saying, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we're going to do. And they went back there and they built it and everyone lived happily ever after. No, it, it ends with kind of a, a question mark. And because that's it's a question that we're each being asked in every generation and on a personal basis, perhaps every day, you know, am I am I ready to to stop, or am I going to am I going to keep wondering and questioning and and searching for for new possibilities? So thank you so much for bringing that up. And then let me call upon uh, Paul. Okay. Uh, in the past, we we discussed uh, Aaron and the loss of the two cho of his two sons, and uh, I I accepted the group's uh, handling of it. Uh, I noticed we skipped the uh, the emotion that the that the mother might have had. Maybe that was something that's grouped on to stay away from me. But uh, this time suddenly comes this discussion of Aaron and, uh, and the, Moses is told about, uh, hey, you know what? Uh, that guy Aaron, if he does something wrong, this is, he, gets, he gets killed again. And so I didn't understand why there had to be the, the why it has to be brought up again you know, we know that the two the two sons were, were were murdered, and then now you're talking about, hey, that gentleman we just knocked off his two sons. That gentleman, if he doesn't do something right, he stands a chance of getting killed. Also, it's it's. I mean, if I was presented with a job opportunity like that, I I would really feel a little bit tough about the guy in command. That's pretty tough, actually. <laughs> okay, someone want to kind of take up on that. Um, so you part of, go ahead, David. I was just going to say, I was, had a analogous reaction at the beginning of the Torah portion, which is Aaron's just lost his two sons, and that's mentioned for no particular reason at the beginning. And then Aaron is told to go up and make a sacrifice and ask for forgiveness of all the sins of his family, all the sins of the people. And I just was imagining in my mind what it might be like when you're, I don't know, a normal reaction is to be a little pissed off at God when it, he kills your kids. And then you're ordered to go and um, ask for forgiveness for your sins and for your family's sins. Uh, and for some weird reason, that struck me as somewhat similar to the Kaddish in the sense your Kaddish is for mourning, but it doesn't say anything about mourning. It says, you know, God is great. So let me uh, enter into the conversation that, that I you Dave, have I, did, I, I thought David just agreed with me. Did I hear it right? 
Well, let me let me let me uh, <laughs> share in, in your conversation that you, that you and and David are kind of raising by going back to something that was in the study sheet that I skipped over, which is from the Mishnah Pirkei Avot, which is this phrase that says, "Against your will, you live." Now, there's a Hasidic understanding of that, which is this: is that is that um, the notion in the Hasidic tradition is that we have a desire to attach ourselves to the source of all life, that we desire to make connection with the the power of the universe, that which gives uh, life to everything, and and in the Hasidic view, if if you do that, if you do that in a way that gives total surrender to that, uh, that you, in a sense, live what they would call a life of ultra spirituality, a and you would not be engaged in the in the needs and responsibilities and details of a mundane life, and the, in, in that Hasidic understanding, uh, that's not our purpose. Our purpose is not to go where God dwells. Our purpose is to make this world one where God dwells. And, and so that one needs to return back into this world uh, and make this place a better place. So against your will, you live in that Hasidic tr tradition means you want to be so thoroughly attached to God that you have no presence in this world dimension. And, and so there is a, a recognition of the responsibility to de deny that urge uh, of being so totally one with God and to come back into this world where one lives and, and makes this world uh, a better and different place. So, um, so that's just a little bit of, so that's a roundabout way of saying, in a part, that's how that tradition might look at Nadav and Abihu, which is that they just wanted to embrace the, the, the power of the universe and gave no thought to what the restraints might be necessary or constraints might be necessary or what the responsibilities might be in, in this world. They were just so uh, enthusiastic uh, and wanted to just surrender. And um, so that's part of uh, one analysis, one view about Nadav and Abihu. And Aaron represents the figure who needs to maintain some kind of rigorous relationship with the power of the universe, makes contact with it, yeah. and is so disciplined, <clears throat> doesn't stay there, comes back, returns back into the world uh, to fulfill other responsibilities. And so, that's why the the that uh, archetypal role of the high priest uh, is portrayed this way is that yeah you could just give yourself over to it but you need to come back out of having entered into the holy of holies made contact with that concentrated presence of of God and come back into this world and uh, care for your family and fulfill your other communal responsibilities so that uh, Anna did you have something you wanted to say. Well I was, I didn't put my hand up and I did not gesture, but I've been sitting here thinking about this painting you chose. And I, I don't know, I suppose, I would hope that all of us at some point in our life have had the experience of just walking through a big empty field or a big empty sand dune. Uh, I can remember wheat fields that never seemed to end and walking long ways, to take messages you just walking like going through this picture when you start walking you become a rhythm you have uh, you know something repeats over and over in your body it's like a meditation it's like I mean you long to get to the end of the walk there's but it's it's manifest longing is manifest and it's almost like an altered state it's like it, if you don't want to be Nadav and Abihu and get too close, and, and you don't want to be too far away, maybe you just need to keep walking. Keep walking until <laughs> you get to the sea. Yeah. But let me just, let me call upon uh, Robert and, and then Steve, and, and then I'll call upon Rich. Yes, Robert. 
Peace. Thank you so much. And again, for a lovely evening and all the uh, insightful remarks. You know, it's been said uh, that uh, to whom much is given, much is expected. And so when we look at creation, we see we have mineral spirit, vegetable spirit, animal spirit, and human spirit. But human spirit comprises all of the others. It has the power of composition, has the power of growth that vegetables have, has the power of senses, animal has. But we also have the ability for the power of faith through the gift of God. And uh, when I think of what we've been given, then much is expected. And God is mystery, and his teachings are mystery. And if we try and understand the mind of God, we've already lost, mm -hmm. because we can't. But when all is said and done, it comes down, I believe, to what you summated. And that is our role. My understanding is our role is to acquire faith in all the qualities, the attributes. But then they should shine outside of us and make a difference in the world. So therefore, we're called upon to arise and struggle. And faith is a test. And faith and a good life, a pure life, is not for the faint of heart. And there is a division that we see. Those who have, for example, the capacity to hate. But there isn't one person on this screen that has that capacity. I've never been understand, able to understand hate because I'm not capable of it. I didn't grow up with it, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we're blessed, I think, in being able to understand that there's a path of faith God has given us, no matter what our religion, the essentials are the same, arise and struggle and have faith in the Lord. You know, he's God, we're his servants. We ever confuse that, we know we're in big trouble. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. <laughs> and Steve Breton, did you want to uh, share something? I'm going to try, but like I say, you want, if I get lost somewhere and it sounds like I'm just rambling, you know, be, you can just pull the plug on me. <laughs> you got, you, you introduced all this by the show of stuff. And as I, I look at this picture and I've tried to see it here, so I tried to enlarge it someplace. You go to the museum site, you can't enlarge it because that's, a, a get, well, I'm going, I'm going to say it seems like it's going to be disrespectful. But that all being said, your word description and your mailing talks about how this is made of on top of burlap and charcoal, and it's hanging on this wall, and the charcoal is falling off. And you're talking about the Shoah, and I'm seeing masses of people on a road to oblivion. And, you know, I, I don't find that, I, that's what I see. I can't make out more details. And hearing that there's charcoal in there, yeah, there's little spots of color. I have to take that, it's hard to see. But yeah, this is a, and trying to make sense of Bohemia Lies by the Sea and the first poem. If Bohemia lies, still lies by the sea, it doesn't lie by the sea where this, this person I'm saying she's writing this poem to find some meaning to the show of the people that were marching into this oblivion. And it's, she, if, if Bohemia still lives by the sea, that, which is a pipe dream, I'll believe in the sea again. I'll have something to believe in. And believing in the sea, thus I can find, find hope for the land that I'm not march, marching off into oblivion. Once it, or the ovens, if I want to make it more, because I, in the context, the artist and the poet are talking about the Shoah. I, that, everything I say is based on that. The poet, I still border on a word, which I think turns out to be the sea, and another on land. I border it like little else on everything and more. And then describing a bohemian life who has nothing, held by nothing, gifted only by seeing, by a doubtful sea, saying, you know, hey, I'm in my land, this land of my choice, and all I can do is wander and try to see a sea that is not there because I'm marching to my death. I'm like I say, I'm sorry to go to all that death stuff, but you know, well, laying up by the artist and the poet are talking about the yeah. Holocaust. So in that case, uh, Ingeborg Bachmann is, is demonstrating through her poetry an act of resistance 
against a language that sought to impose final answers and final solutions uh, to, to things uh, and to a people. And, but more generally, uh, she's trying to resist a culture that imagines that only what exists is what's possible, which is uh, a, a limitation uh, on, on human imagination, if you will. And so she is imagining that it to, to defy what seems to be the case and to continue to want to aspire towards what seems to be impossible. And her message is, it's only by walking towards what seems to be impossible that we can create uh, great things, that we can expand the horizon, if you will, uh, and that we can regenerate life and hope. And so I want to put it in, in, in this context, uh, which is that we have we started out, at least through my presentation of, you know, very uh, serious historical context. But I, I want to bring it into a, a more uh, intimate context, because I think that's what sacred literature is uh, really designed to have us do, is to focus on the intimate, uh, because that's where love and possibilities and, and new life is, is really generated. Uh, and to acknowledge that uh, all of you, uh, by dealing with this body of literature, this wisdom, uh, and, and not merely accepting what it seems to say on its surface, but probing this literature itself, uh, digging deeper into it, uh, and seeing uh, the possibilities that lie uh, beneath it and bring it to the surface. That is holy work. And that's the work that continues to promote uh, the sense of possibilities and expansion of the horizon, uh, and ultimately that leads us towards uh, true healthy intimacy uh, that's the source of all life. So I thank you all very much uh, for participating in that great venture and that great journey and for uh, being underway in a way that brings greater holiness in the world. Thank you all very much. Look forward to our, our next gathering. Thank, thank, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.